Well, hello, you bearded bastards, and welcome back once again to my fall like him. Chamber point. Where is the 26th of Hematite, 1211? Early summer of our sixth year, I believe? Could be. It's easy to lose track. Currently, our coastal home is actually fairly peaceful. I go back and forth with this so much, I realize it's peaceful, it's angry. I should say uneventful. Right now, it's uneventful. <laughs> Nobody's currently being murdered in our coastal home, and everyone is busy at work. I'm trying to get in a bunch of that work right now because coming up is our second angry tournament, which is sure to be very exciting. And remember, this time we're actually going to take a little bit of downtime too, force the dwarves to take it easy a bit. I think that'd be a pretty good idea. Gods know we need it. I'm having a look real quick, you can see we're gussing up a few of our existing structures, like our fishery which we're making into a guild hall. Chamber Point does have its fair share of fishery workers, as you could imagine. Down here in the mines, on one of the upper levels, we're actually opening it up a bit so we can make a mason's guild hall. That'd be nice for them. This will be our first underground structure, or carving, I guess, room. It should work out pretty well. I'm gonna smooth it up nice, has a ways to go, but it's getting done. And then right over here, we have a new temple being built, a temple for the wealthy creed. A local religion. We should actually take a look at our god sometime soon, shouldn't we? We do have some interesting ones, but we're gonna hold off a bit still. Have some other things to attend to. And the thing most of our residents are waiting for with great anticipation is the return of our scout, Ted Anyamil, the Test Trees Warrior, and her mount, Blunted Hatchet, the Horn Beetle. We had just sent them out not too long ago to a hillix owned by the Abbey of Proliferation. They're heading there in search of an artifact that is rumored to be in the area and it's our hope that they return with it. And would you speak of the devil? She just returned. Welcome back, Ted. And we could see too that her horn beetle has joined her as well. Very good. Now let's check that report. Mission report. Raid Satiny Strikes. Summer 1211. Okay, she heads down to the area. <laughs> Slipped into Satiny Strikes undetected. She searched the place and stole that artifact. Oh, that's pretty darn good. A success. Easy enough. Now, Ted, let's have a look at this item, shall we? Kosiaspku, Zoliasma, Glad Riddled, The Chastity of Fortifying, A Silver Two-Handed Sword. Brilliant. I had no idea what it was going to be. It's worth 48,000. Very respectable. This here is a silver two-handed sword. All craftsmanship is of the highest quality. It is encircled with bands of white stork bone and also menaces with spikes of troll bone. Wow, that's a cool one. A silver two-handed sword. Yeah, yeah, I really like that. Um, stork bone as the grip and then just some extra touches of that troll bone just to toughen it up a bit. I am in love, but you know what? I think someone else is more in love with this than I am and I think it's Ted. That's right. I think we should give it to Ted. Now, bear in mind that dwarves can't typically use two-handed swords, but Ted is not a dwarf. She's a test tree, and so is quite a bit bigger than a dwarf. I can't picture her having any trouble wielding it. Also, I mean, <laughs> it probably is the best weapon in the entire fortress. So what the hell? There we have it. Wield that well, Ted. Not too sure the story behind its creation, but I'm sure that in your hands, it's a legend will only grow. You know what, we should give her a customized house at some point too, shouldn't we? Yeah, gonna be putting some thought into that. Anyways, rest up for now, Ted. And remember that next angry tournament is just around the corner. And you know what? Well, I was really hoping we could do some more with the uh, the layout and the gleeful fish man here, but it's pretty much the same as it was last year. We've had too much on our plate, really, but that's fine. It's gonna be fine. Not too worried about it. Um, I was saying before that we can hold a different competition every year. Like maybe this year could be gem cutting or something, but I don't think that's gonna be the case. I think we're just gonna focus on cooking. It works out pretty well and it was a big hit last year. And so yes, that's exactly what we're going to do. Oh, and you know what? Before the event begin, I would like to point out this Gorlak here. This is Lore Uthmixeneg, another cook. We'd actually forgotten to include her last year, but she doesn't mind. However, this year she will definitely be included. Things do tend to get a bit mixed up around here sometimes, but not this year. She will gladly be joining the others. 
Having a look at the date, it's now the 4th of Limestone, so we still have about a month before the events begin. And so I figured we could actually take a look around the place a little bit. There are a couple things worth noting. Well, for one, our population is now at 147, which is pretty respectable. Not too sure how many bedrooms we have at this point, but I will tell you what. It's kind of difficult to build those big bedroom structures that we've been making, especially after this big one over here. There are 12 bedrooms here, 6 on the ground floor and 6 up above. And a building like this takes a considerable amount of rock blocks to make. And we gotta get them up quickly. Can't have dwarves sleeping out in the rain now, can we? Anyways, where I'm going with this is that we've also been making some additional houses lately in less conventional spaces. Like, well, if we have a look over here at these houses and up, you can see there's a couple of long attic living spaces here. Very narrow, but spacious nonetheless. Especially that eastern one. A very nice bedroom it makes, actually. It's quite well liked by its occupant. And then actually down here above the Crafts Dwarf Guild Hall, we can look up and see these three enormous bedrooms. Quite large. They will certainly do the trick. In here we're going to be housing craftsmen specifically. Probably some of the best craftsmen in the fort. Just makes sense, you know. Down here, just on the coast, we have a couple of new structures, a wood-burning building, and also a ceramics building, where we've been producing a whole load of clay crafts. We'll show off some of those in a bit. Up above these two structures, we also have two houses. Spacious houses, of course. Going to be well appointed. And they will probably belong to the most skilled members of each of those professions. That should work out pretty well. We did the same thing down here at the fishery workshop. Up above, we have a nice attic living space going in. And then right over here, the wind generating structure. Up above, where Stackhood's bedroom is, we actually put in six more bedrooms. Enormous bedrooms with beds and furniture kind of sitting on the beams in here. It's a strange layout to be sure, but it works, and the dwarves who live here seem to like it quite a lot. Great to see. At some point we'll have to do a count to see how many bedrooms we actually have. Don't want to make too many now, do we? Mo well, and right, one last house to look at. It's Ted's house. A very nice place indeed. Has a dining room, a bedroom, both with plenty of nice furniture. Up above there's a small attic storage area. Not much in there. But down below we've also built a pasture for Blunted Hatchet, her beetle. Made sure to keep a dirt floor in there so that cave moss can grow. Microcline walls too. Had a bunch of spare blocks so I figured what the hell. Yes, this is going to work out just fine. Well now, back over here to the settlement. It is now the first of Sandstone, 1211. Which means it's time for our second annual Angry Tournament. I will note, too, that the dwarves are not allowed to do any work right now. We've made it impossible for them to do so. They can go home, they can eat food, they can worship in temples or go to their guild halls, and that's about it. For an entire month, even. Or maybe a little longer, too. We'll see how long this whole event takes. Okay, now we're going to jump ahead a little bit here. Our contestant cooks are already hard at work making their dishes. They've been scurrying around all over the place, and it's been quite hard to keep track of them. And so I figure we'll just cut to the chase. A strange thing that was noted is that they all grabbed vegetables, or plants I should say. Not too sure the reasoning behind that, but well, it'll be different from last year, that's for sure. Alright, looks like they're just wrapping up now. And so, Gorlax, we are extremely eager to see what you cooked up, so let's get straight to the judging portion. We'll go from left to right here. First up, we have Kogan's dish, a stack of 11 prickleberry roasts. The ingredients are prickleberry, prickleberry, celery, and yet some more prickleberry. Well, you know, that is something right there. Um, a lot of prickleberry. And I gotta say, it is pretty impressive how we arranged it like this. We have the chopped up celery, along with all these prickleberries here. It all comes together to make sort of a, a berry salad with some garnishes of celery. Very unique. Maybe a bit risky due to its simplicity, but a good job nonetheless, Kogan. Up next, we have Ast, or Sausages Creation, the champion from last year, remember? And it looks like she has prepared five superiorly prepared lettuce roasts. The ingredients are fisherberry, wild carrot plants, prickleberry, and lettuce. Well, that's creative. It looks like she's mashed up the berries and combined them with that wild carrot and has it all arranged inside the lettuce, like some sort of a lettuce wrap or something. Very interesting. <laughs> we actually just found out that the Gorlax planned to do this vegetarian cook-off in honor of our elven residents, which I think is a very nice gesture. Not so appealing to us dwarves, of course, but, well, as long as the elves like it, it's really the least we can do, especially considering recent events. More on that later. Anyways, a fantastic dish sausage. Good luck to ya. Coming up next, we have Saxel's meal, which is a stack of 13 superiorly prepared lettuce roasts. The ingredients are wild carrot plant, muck root, wild carrot plant, and lettuce. Huh. Well, that's something right there. 
very similar to Ast's dish. Again, we appear to have some sort of a, a lettuce wrap. That is interesting. It looks to be a little different for sure. Not as sweet, definitely. Extremely earthy. With a carrot alongside that muck root. You know, you wouldn't think it works so well, but to the dwarven palate? Well, actually, it's pretty darn good. It reminds one of the mountain homes. In a strange way. It is very unlike something a dwarf would enjoy, but masterfully prepared. Good job. Nice work here, Saxel. You know, some people here in the fortress don't think that portion size should be taken into consideration while judging these meals, but we have a lot of mouths to feed. And the more you can cook up, the better. And now moving on to our last dish, Lore's dish, her first time competing this year. It looks like she's cooked up a stack of 11 radish plant roasts. The ingredients are celery, chicory, celery, and radish. And it makes for an interesting spread. It looks like Lore has hollowed out some of the radishes and made a mixture to stuff into them. A mixture of chicory, celery, and radish just kind of blended up. Well, a high marks for creativity, that's for sure. And the flavor's not terrible. Not terrible. And, well, I like what she's done with the radish there. Yeah, that's something. Good job there. Um, Lore, you know, I think we're gonna have to get some meats ready for next year's cook-off. Fish, too, perhaps? Cheese? Yeah, that sounds good. Anyways, yes, nice work. Thank you very much for participating, and best of luck to you. Now then, what do you say, people? I think it's time to move on to the judging portion, and the winner of the second annual Angry Tournament is... Saxel, with his masterfully made lettuce wraps. And wow, isn't that impressive? That was a dish that clearly outclassed the rest, both in quality and quantity. Very impressive, my friend. And having a look at the day, it is now the 24th of Sandstone, which means, of course, that the events are about to conclude. That's fine, though. I think we've gotten enough rest. Yes, I think this is exactly how we're going to do it each year. Gives everyone a nice chance to just relax a bit. Something that's sorely needed. Oh, and, uh, right... Saxel's prize. I suppose we made sausage a house last year. We better do the same thing with Saxel too, huh? It's only right. Now then, dwarves, it's time to get back to work, so let's do it. This year is going to be our year. <sighs> but that does not ever seem to be the case for Chamber Point. At all, really. And it's frustrating. We've been here for quite a few years now. What's it been, six, maybe? And what have we actually done? Nothing, really. And we know that, it's obvious. But damn it, it's just so easy to be complacent. And even in our complacency, nobody seems happy. And nobody knows that better than Udil Unolmosus, our mayor, who has recently undergone a bit of a change of mood. For a while, we've been referring to him as the miserable necromancer, and, well, he still is fairly miserable, that's for sure. But it's a bit different now. You see, while still miserable, Udil here now believes that those who sacrifice for others should be deeply respected. He also strongly values tranquility and quiet, has a negative view of those who exercise power over others, values knowledge, sees competition as wasteful and silly, which, as a leader around here, he's the one who first ordered the angry tournament. So in spite of this view, I'm sure he's doing it for his citizens. Because the biggest change that he's experienced is that he would have the world operate in complete harmony without the least bit of strife or disorder. He's really become a very peace-loving fellow, and these are all changes that have occurred since he's been here in Chamber Point. I should also mention too that that last bit there, where he wants to see the world come together in perfect harmony, that was a change that occurred after he saw one of his dearest friends perish. Ale, a panda person. And, well, this was pretty shocking. I didn't realize it till it happened, but that panda person was the very last one in the fortress. Yeah. The very last one. We have no more panda people at all. They have all perished. And I'll also note that none of them starved to death. It's not due to having no bamboo, I'll tell you that much. No, they just weren't happy here, so we had to exile some of them. Either that or they were all just beaten to death by stack cut in our early days. Kind of hard to say at this point. But does not change the fact that we do not have any more panda people. Which really affected this guy. Remember, he really likes pandas. And by extension, panda people. And so I don't blame him for changing. He feels bad that he couldn't protect them, and I'm sure he continues to feel bad that his people are so miserable. And so yes, we haven't been focusing too hard on growing our military power, or fighting the Abbey of Proliferation. But, you know what? That's just okay. Our people deserve to be happy. And that's something that's going to have to take priority. That being said, in the meantime, we're going to keep sending Ted out on her little raids. 
We just so the people here can feel like we're doing something. It'll be a slow process, but we'll get there one day. This world will be peaceful. <sighs> okay, now, moving on. Actually, we had just sent Ted out right before we looked in on the mayor here, and it looks like she just returned. Very good, let's check that report. Mission report, raid zaddy strikes. Okay, she heads down to the place. Easy enough. Arrives, is undetected. Searched the place and found nothing. Oh, well, that's it. But she wasn't spotted at least. I know there really wasn't that much there, but I figured she's got to get her sneaking skill up still a little bit. And that place's population is so low that I figured it wouldn't be a big, big problem. Just until she starts to get a real feel for it. Don't want to be too risky now, do we? The Cyclops, Paramythifiri Lepidagi, has come. A giant humanoid monster with a single eye set in its forehead. Damned by the gods. This is not good. And as you can see, she's charging straight in. Now, having a look down here at our wall, a bridge is in place, but it's not linked up to anything, so it's not going to do us any good whatsoever. <laughs> that being said, we're basically out of options, but we're not going down without a fight. We could hide down in the mines or cloister away inside our homes, but no, that's not what we're here for. Chamber Point is peaceful, and we are trying our very best. This one-eyed marauder won't be the end of us. Having a look down here, towards the Rangers Guild, well, <laughs> you can see we're mounting a, a brave and desperate defense. The stack cut has arrived on the scene, but other than him, we don't really have much else. Ted is on her way, but I'm not sure where she is. Besides that, you'll notice we have a substantial number of grizzly bears inside the Rangers Guild, which some of the civilians are bringing outside now, and, well, they're placing them here, in an area where we think the Cyclops will have to pass through. They're not trained or anything, so I'm not too sure how much good this will do us, but, well, we're low on options. Here we go. Stackhut is charging in, and unfortunately, he's all by himself right now. <sighs> really, I'm not too sure how much of a chance he stands. We do have others coming but they're still a ways away. Oh no, he's already taken a huge hit here. Damn it, he goes flying back. He's landed, is terribly disoriented, trying to get his bearing, but he is continuing to take hits. He's down, bleeding badly. The Cyclops is right on top of him. <sighs> Damn it all. The stack HUD has fallen in defense of Chamber Point. <sighs> damn it, damn it, damn it. Ted is supposed to be here too, but I'm not too sure where she is right now. As for the bears, there's only one in the area. The rest are currently being handled by civilians, who I'm sure the Cyclops will spot just momentarily, gonna speed things up briefly. Okay, Cyclops is just standing there, but has spotted the bears and is moving in, has killed one already as well as a civilian, and is continuing on beating bears and dwarves. There are some hunters here too. None of our hunters are particularly well trained, but if we can get enough arrows in the air, then it might do us some good. Another dwarf has fallen, and another, as well as a bear. Gonna speed things up again briefly. All right, we have some hunters in the area. The Cyclops has fallen into the pond. A huge splash of water there. Water and mud. What a damn mess. Come on, pile on. Uh. Well, it looks like some of our civilians are trying to keep it in the pond right now, which could be pretty helpful. Necromancers have arrived in the area. Things are about to get extremely messy, I think. Let's hope for the best. Not too sure what's going to come with this. Um, the Cyclops is still down in the pond, and civilians are crowding the area currently. Um, this, this could be bad. Uh, the Necromancers still have not seen the Cyclops, and therefore have yet to do any sort of resurrecting, which might be for the best, especially with those dead bears in the area. Things will certainly get messy if those things come back to life. I mean, things are messy already. Very messy. I'm trying to figure out what's going on here. The civilians are really letting this guy have it, but this is not going to do anything for anybody's moods, I'll tell you that much. 
yeah, we got a lot of people panicking. Can't really blame them, including the bears. I figured their natural aggression would help us out here, but that is definitely not the case. And truth be told, I was really hoping our necromancers might do something for our deceased civilians. But again, does not look to be the case at all. We have begun speeding things. Oh, undead activity. There are people who are being brought back to life, both intelligent and unintelligent undead creatures, which might turn out to be extremely bad news for us. Hard to tell what's going on right now. It's, uh, it's chaos, pure chaos. But here's hoping we can sort things out after it's settled down. Though I'm not sure I'd get my hopes up about that. Blood, there's pieces all over the place of our dwarves and other civilians, grizzly bears, shambling corpses. It's gotten to be pretty impossible to tell what's going on here. But again, <laughs> we don't really have any option other than to just let it play out right now. You know, I think that's going to do it right there. The Cyclops has died down in the pond, just kind of bobbing down there now. For most of that fighting, it had actually been knocked unconscious, and our recruits were up here just kind of punching down at it. I think some of them had weapons, but not many of them. Um, and as I had mentioned, we did have some undead activity. Some of the bears were brought back to life, but also some of our dwarves as well. Well... Just taking a little little breather here now. <laughs> Something we really badly need. Man, how about another holiday sort of event, huh? Might be for the best after this mess. Checking the population, we're down to 144 dwarves now. So we really didn't lose that many. I forget how many we were at before. And that is thanks, in no small part, to our necromancers, I believe. They did bring back those zombies which made things a bit messy, but it also did bring back some intelligent undead as well and really helped to cut down on our losses. Having a look over here in our hospital, you can see four damned ones, intelligent undead that were brought back by the necromancers. They're all pretty beaten up as you could imagine fighting that Cyclops and the grizzly bears, but I believe with some medical attention, they should be back up on their feet. A very interesting turn. We'll have to keep our eyes on them. I'm interested to see how they behave. In here, we have Lolor, Mesthos, and Kibish, two hunters and our former military commander. But also in here is Stackhud. Yes, that's right. He was brought back to life as a damned one. Now, isn't that something? We didn't lose the guy after all. That being said, he, uh, he has taken some damage. His left wrist is mangled, his skull is fractured, and, well, his left hand is mangled beyond recognition. But... You know, that should be fine. We'll get a splint put on there, and he might end up making a full recovery. I suppose we'll have to see. That is very exciting. Glad to have you back, buddy. Hang in there. Having another look at the scene of this battle here, you can see that there is yet another damned one. Uh, just kind of milling about the area. A little strange. It's not like the other ones. It's not working or anything like that. Doesn't have a name. Nobody knows who it is. Yes, this is very interesting. And repellent, actually. <laughs> This particular one has its stomach ripped open, and its entrails are piled out on the ground next to it. A terrible sight. I'm uh, not too sure what we could do about that, except just leave it to its business, I suppose. Nobody knows who this is? Or was? No? I guess, guess not. Well, at least it was no one important, right? Hmm. Keep, keep at it, then. Very strange. Seems we have a lot to learn about these new undead. Having a look back over here at the hospital, we can see three of those four damned ones that were in here are now out and about somewhere in the fortress. There is still one in here, and from what I can see, it is terribly wounded. Its brain is mangled, and its head is just blasted apart. But it still moves with quite a bit of vigor. Oh, and there it goes, out and about, back into the fortress. Huh. Ah, uh, yes, and here's Stackhud. 
doing very well, spectacularly well actually. His hand is still a bit beaten up and his skull still appears to be fractured, but other than that, well he's not doing too bad at all. Something else I've noticed is that all of these damned ones, they seem very neutral in their mood, which is something. They have resumed their old lives, but any negative emotions they were experiencing seem to have been erased. Positive emotions too, but well, maybe emotions just get in the way sometimes. This could be pretty handy, I'm thinking. Noted. Moving on. We're back over here once again with our Mayor Udil, the Necromancer. And, well, we were going to have a look at some of our gods, weren't we? And I figured we should start off with some of the ones that he believes in, because he's been thinking about them an awful lot lately. Now, I'm going to note straight off the bat that he has some atypical beliefs when it comes to his deities. You see, Udil's chosen deity is not one worshipped by glad boulder dwarves. No, no. Udil's chosen deity is Gostrim Pamnot, the Velvet of Vaults, a god of the Vermilion Empires, a human empire. The stranger still is the fact that this god is not a god of death, nor of mountains, wealth, jewels. The Velvet of Vaults takes the form of a male human, and is associated with oaths, marriage, Pregnancy, children, family, birth, creation, and rebirth. Oh yes, Udil's been thinking a lot of his deity lately. Especially that rebirth bit. It seems that maybe, just maybe, he's figured out a way to calm his coastal home. Well, hello, you bearded bastards, and welcome to the end of the episode where we're going to be talking about some behind the scenes things. Now, to be perfectly frank, I'm not too sure what to talk about without saying the same things I've been saying, that is. Chamber point is a big pain in the ass. Oh, oh, uh, speaking of which, actually, on that subject, how cool is it that I just made that animated intro there that included both pandas and Stackud? And now there's no more pandas in the fortress, and Stackud is a damned one. Isn't that killer? <laughs> Oh my, well I guess that's just the way things go sometimes. That Cyclops, by the way, quite a dangerous foe. Um, it's funny how careless you can be until something goes down like that, and then you realize you're screwed. I suppose, although, I mean, I should say we got out of it pretty lucky. A Cyclops isn't that bad. I mean, if it was a dragon, or Velvet of Vaults forbid, a Titan, well, we could very well have been screwed. And speaking of which... Uh, Forgotten Beasts, we haven't really had the caves open, have we? I think I mentioned last episode that we were thinking of going down there. Uh, didn't end up doing that. It's funny, this episode here actually um started off really slow, I think, as have many of the episodes so far. But boy, that Cyclops really stirred things up a bit. I think it's just what we needed. <laughs> oh, yes. I have a feeling that Big Bastard was a catalyst for all kinds of interesting developments here in Chamber Point. Now, I know there's people out there who like a nice, peaceful coastal home, but, you know, sometimes things, they get away from you. And, well, let's face it, it's not really that peaceful anymore at all. <laughs> it's kind of a hellhole, but it's okay. You know what? I trust Udiel. Seems like our mayor has a real good head on his shoulders, and I think he does have a good plan up his sleeves. Time will tell, of course. Maybe you figured it out already. I'm sure you have. Oh, and you know what? One last thing here. While I'm thinking of it, I was trying to get Mrs. K, my wife, the one who colors in all the pictures, I was trying to get her to participate in this behind-the-scenes look, but my goodness, she's terribly shy. Now, I don't want to pressure her too hard. She doesn't know I'm saying this right now, but maybe if you guys get down in the comments and ask her real, real nice, she might do it. I don't know. No promises. We'll see what happens. Again, not going to force her if she doesn't want to. Anyways... Okay, wrapping things up, you bearded bastards. I'm going to tell you what, thank you for watching. I appreciate it, as I always do. And I certainly hope you'll join me next time here in Mafalakil, Chamber Point, the womb of a new empire. And until then, you bearded bastards. <laughs>